amazing to be with you here as part of this incredible opportunity for everyone to learn about how to have not just relationships, but fierce relationships, fierce conversations, fierce love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it is so great to see you, Gina. There you are in Ireland, and here I am in Seattle, Washington, and yet I feel like we're in the same room. It's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And to be able to have a conversation about conversations yeah. from yeah. two different parts of the world, but still with that great human connection, yeah. I'm ab absolutely excited about this to explore the incredible diverse threads that you pull together from the Maasai to Persian lyric poets to <laughs> real life examples of relationships that don't go so well and some that do go so well and what makes them have the difference between them. This is just going to be so much fun. Are you ready? I am so ready. And I'm glad you mentioned the uh, the, the Persian poets because the book begins with this really short poem that I just love. It's yes. uh, by Hafiz and it's it's all just a love contest and I never lose. Now you have another good reason to spend time with me. And that's really what this book is all about. You know, why would your partner or potential partner or spouse or whatever, why would that person really, really want to spend time with you? Uh, and what does that require? And how do you navigate? Oh, fantastic. And so let's go from the contest of love to how you can win that contest of love. Welcome everyone to Fierce Love, the podcast. I'm Gina London, and I am joined by New York Times bestselling author, Susan Scott, who's made for the last 20 years, an incredible impact on the lives of business leaders all over the world, helping them understand through fierce conversations how to better connect with their customers, with their employees, and with each other. And so, Susan, I'm going to let you kick us off and tell us now the book is Fierce Love, the podcast is Fierce Love. How does that connect? Why now? Yeah. Honestly, Gina, writing this book kept me in a state of humility and mystery because I began to understand things that I have always known, but I understood in a very different way. And it started years ago when um, my niece, Margot, called me. She was a little girl at the time. And she said, I've had an apostrophe. <laughs> an apostrophe? An <laughs> apostrophe. And, and she meant epiphany, but I, I knew what she meant. And I loved the idea of having an apostrophe and maybe even an exclamation point, you know, at the very least a semicolon. So there were, there were two apostrophes that caused me to do everything that I was doing in the business. It really completely transformed how I was working with the CEOs in my think tanks. And it, everything applies in the same way to these personal relationships. So the first one is, I mean, it came when I was reading Hemingway's The Sun Also Rises, in which a character is asked, how did you go bankrupt? And he responds, gradually and then suddenly. And I, yeah. I just really howled at that point because I think we always wake up if we arrive at a negative suddenly, but we're not always awake during gradually, which is where we spend most of our lives. And as a matter of fact, Fierce Love begins with a true story about a couple um, who they, neither of them knew that they were about to, to hit the wall, the suddenly, but they happened mm. to be in uh, the Lake District of the UK taking a walk and um, it was Louise and Tom and Louise was, you know, her husband clearly was not enjoying himself. And at one point they stopped to have a little picnic and a clearing. And she said, you, I don't think you're very happy today. And he said, well, frankly, I would rather be golfing. And that was when Louise arrived at her suddenly. She had moved from, you know, Many years earlier when they married, you know, I most certainly do take you to 
No, I don't. <laughs> I don't. I'm done. It's over. I'm out. And she ends up throwing their wedding rings into a lake. And both of them are kind of stunned at what they did, but that was there suddenly. And I think so often marriages hit, um, I don't know, a, a ceiling, a plateau. They're, they're in a slump, they're in a routine, their perspective is limited. And when they're approaching a suddenly, they sometimes go to marriage counseling, but at that point, it's often a little bit too late, you know? Um, and they have all of these reasons why they just cannot talk with one another about some of the things that are bothering them. And yet reason is no match for pain. Um, you know, if a, if a partner says that he or she doesn't want to talk about something, you might want to respond with, yeah, I know, I understand, but the things that you're unwilling to discuss, I think are killing us. And, you know, if a problem exists, it exists whether we talk about it or not. So we need to talk about it. And so this, so fierce love is all about helping couples gain the skill and the courage to have those conversations, to stay current with one another. So that first apostrophe is about <laughs> gradually, then suddenly, we always wake up when we arrive at suddenly, how do we stay awake during gradually and stay current with our partners? The second one, in some ways is even more profound, at least it, 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 is, it has been for me. And that is, you know, the young man who's, who's newly married is often puzzled, perplexed, even maybe a little irritated that this <laughs> lovely person with whom he wants to spend the rest of his life insists on appearing before his face on a regular basis, wanting to talk yet again about the same thing. And it's often the quality of their relationship. And he wonders, why are we talking about this again? Could we, could we just have one huge conversation about our relationship and coast for a year? But here she is again. And eventually, if he's been paying attention, it dawns on him, you know what, this ongoing robust conversation that I've been having with my wife is not about the relationship. The conversation is the relationship. That's an apostrophe if ever I heard of one there, Susan. Absolutely. Yeah, I know. What do we do with that understanding then? Well, we have to realize that if the conversation is the relationship, you know, if, if, if anyone who is, is listening to this or watching this recognizes there may be something to that, then if the conversation stops, well, you, you know, you can do the math. Or if, if you and I add another topic to the list of things we just can't talk about because it wrecks another weekend, then all of the possibilities for our relationship become smaller and we even make ourselves quite small, um, recognizing that we're behaving as if we're just a space around our shoes. We're engaged in yet another two minute conversation that's so empty of meaning it crackles. And so if you, if you, if you sense that there is something to this notion that the conversation is the relationship, then ask yourself, what what is the quality of my conversations with my partner? What are we talking about? What are we avoiding talking about? Are we in complete agreement about where we're headed and how we're doing? I mean, you know, what is our trajectory here? And is there a conversation that is waiting for us that really we, we, we really need to have? And I want to get, I want to try to blend the gradual, being aware of the gradual and being meaningful within the gradual so that you can not suddenly have that denouement like the suddenly that, that happened to Tom and Louise. But I also want to weave in that idea of understanding, like you said, that the conversation is the relationship. So how do we intertwine the gradual and meaningful conversations so that we don't get into what I think a lot of couples get into past the romance, flowers and chocolates and lots of 
can I am I allowed to say sex on this on this podcast <laughs> after, we get, after we get past the lustful connection and we get into more of the routine of a relationship how do we have conversations that are meaning that are not just am I picking up the kids or are you picking up the kids or what who's doing the laundry or who's going to take the dog to the vet are those kinds of real just day-to-day logistics conversations how do we make the gradual also meaningful with our conversations great question and, and one comment that i do want to make is yes you know obviously we are often attracted to one another initially because of a physical attraction, that chemistry, that juicy. Yes. Chemistry. But, our, but a relationship has to have something beyond sex. Um, and yes. It, it has to because there, there's not enough Botox and filler in the world to keep us looking <laughs> at a beautiful person who seduced our partner Um, and so we've got to have something much more meaningful so we'll we'll definitely get into the how one of the things that's important to understand is that the, the the goal of a fierce conversation is to come out from behind ourselves into our conversations with one another and and be real be authentic and also to connect with our partner at a deeper level, which if you don't mind, I want to just talk about that second apostrophe, you know, absolutely the is the relationship. And so what, if the conversation is the relationship, what is, what are the, what is the quality? What are we talking about? What are we avoiding? And so one of the things that I always ask the, um, anybody that I'm coaching, CEOs that, I, that I'm coaching, at the very beginning of our session together, I will always ask, you know, what is the most important thing that's on your plate? The most important thing that has your name on it that we should be talking about. And so I think individuals can ask themselves that about their marriages or their commitments or their partners or whatever you know what is the most important thing that we probably should be talking about and and if you if you hear yourself saying gee i don't know challenge yourself ask yourself well what would it be if i did know you know if i did know what is the most important thing it would be x and you're right and you're probably late and you may be on a gradually track that you don't want and you want to make sure you don't end up in the ditch. And so you need to go and have the conversation. And, and there are, I mean, there's, there's so much to how to have the conversation. I, I don't even know where to begin, but each of the chapters in Fierce Love focuses on one of those eight conversations that I feel are super important for any, any couple who wants to have a relationship that is extraordinary, that rises above the ordinary. And then there's, in each chapter, there's a, a true story that illustrates the point. And then there's a roadmap. Here's the kind yes. here's how it unfolds. Here's how you could have it. Here are words you can use. Feel free to use your own words, but here are some words you can use. And it's not that complicated. We just have to decide that, you know, what I, when I said earlier, um, Pain trumps reason. So if I if I recognize that I'm not as happy with my relationship as I'd like to be, and perhaps my partner isn't either, then there's there's a conversation to be had, probably more than one, but at least I've got to start. And when you're talking about, because we've got two of those made, I think the main three premises that you talked about in the first three chapters was that idea that the conversation is the relationship gradually leads to suddenly. And then the third one that you touched on as you were talking about how we need to have conversations with ourselves about what it is, what is it I want is actually the title of your third chapter where you say that the conversations we have, we have them with ourselves, And it's important to have all of those three gears sort of working simultaneously in our awareness to begin to move to that path, I think, 
than yeah. all yeah. those fierce conversations, those meaningful conversations. And is that is that right? Is that the foundation then for this book and for our new approach to meaningful, yeah. enriched relationships through yeah. those conversations? And I'm I'm glad you brought up that third point. I mean what we what we teach is that all conversations are with myself and sometimes they involve other people. In other words, I am running everything that happens in my life, including my conversations and my relationships through my own highly individualized context, my set of beliefs. And often um, the beliefs that we hold are not serving us at all. In fact, they are really in the way. Um, if I if I believe that it is risky to disclose what I'm really thinking and feeling, then I'll probably withhold what I'm really thinking and feeling. And so what, what's going to happen if I do that? Well, nothing useful, nothing good. And so I really, you know, I think about the movie, The Wizard of Oz, where at the very end, Dorothy and the Scarecrow and the Cowardly Lion, the Tin Man and the little dog, Toto, are in the <laughs> Emerald City and they're quaking, you know, their knees are knocking because this huge voice is coming out and there's thunder and lightning and, oh, it's terrifying. This is Oz, you know, the great Oz. And then Toto, the little Cairn Terrier, he goes over to this curtain and he pulls the curtain back and here's this tiny little man who's pulling all these levers and speaking into a microphone and he is Oz. And so we all have our little man behind the curtain who is running the show. And sometimes hmm. we're just not conscious that, you know what, my beliefs, what I believe about myself, about my partner, about our relationship, what I believe causes me to behave the way I behave, you know, whatever actions I take or don't take, and then whatever actions I take or don't take produce the results in my life. So beliefs lead to behavior, lead to results. So I, one, of the, one of the things that I address in Fierce Love is what are some of the beliefs that we have that are squarely in our way? Yeah, you talk about the, our context in, is, I think, one of the ways you describe it. You have a lovely graph in the book as well, which will help the, the readers really get this idea in their minds as they're trying to redirect their beliefs and their behaviors. And so what are some, what is that, that context, that belief system that we bring in to our relationships that we may, maybe many of us aren't aware are impacting in such a way? Well, one of the beliefs is very, very common and it's based on our experience. So it's quite understandable is that, boy, you know, I feel like I really want to have this conversation with my partner, but it's not going to go well. I mean, it, yeah. it's just going to, it's going to disintegrate probably in about 30 seconds, you know, one or both of us are going to get triggered. It's going to turn into an argument. It's going to get really quiet around here. And why would I want that? So, you know, if that's what we believe then of course, we're not going to bring up the topic or whatever. And yet when you develop the skill, the simple, really very easy approaches to having even some potentially tough conversations, it takes the curse off of it. And once you, once you've dipped your toe in the water and find out that, okay, nobody died here, you know, and actually there's something wonderful that happens when, when somebody speaks the truth, at least the truth for them, so much fresh air enters the room, enters the relationship. And so, you know, the belief that I, we just can't talk about this. You don't know my partner. If you knew my partner, you'd understand, you know, why I cannot talk to this person. And, um, so we're letting that be an excuse for not uh, addressing an issue that is really causing a certain amount of stress or pain or worry in our lives. So that, you know, that's just one of many beliefs. Yeah, like when we predetermine the outcome by thinking that, oh, it's going to turn out negatively or we're going to have that argument, we're probably coming into the conversation with those cues that our partner's picking up on which then results in that very thing. So how do we change that context or that lens so that 
we're coming into the conversation with an expectation of enriching the relationship. Is that right? That's right. That's absolutely right. And, you know, every single step that we take, every single word that comes out of our mouth or the in the expressions on our faces and our body language, it all has a, a huge impact on the quality of the conversation. And we need to make sure where we are really disclosing our, our truth, understanding that our partner may have a very different one, which is normal and often the case and that that's perfectly okay. That what's important is that we understand it because, you know, it's, I, I've always loved um, Thoreau. And one of the yes. he says it's not what we it's not what we look at that matters it's what we see, and I agree. So I might be looking at my partner and seeing this person who's going to stonewall me, or this person who's going to you know storm out of the room, this person who's going to slam the door, this person who's going to say I'm not talking about that. And if that's what we see when we look at our partner, then we won't we won't proceed. But if we, if when we look at our partner, we see this person that we love, or at least we used to love and we want to love even more. And that, and we hold our partner able to engage in a conversation with us versus an argument, then, then we tend to, we tend to be much more successful. And, and you, know, you just use a lovely, sorry to cross over you there, Susan, but you just use, speaking of word choice, that's positive. You just use the phrase, you hold your partner able. Yeah. And I want to point that out to the, the, the very focused listeners right now who picked up on that. And those of you who didn't, <laughs> that little nuance can make a difference to how you might package something for yourself as well as for your partner, right? So I think that word choice right there shows that level of detail that we can go to, to try to make sure we're framing something positively to, in order to have that positive outcome and helping our relationship get deeper and more meaningful and not get into a, a fight or a dispute. And, and you know what, <laughs> so often, um, I really am glad you picked up on that because I want to say a little bit more about it. It's so important to understand. Yeah. In companies, when we are doing a training, so often somebody will say, oh my gosh, I would love, it. I would love it if we had conversations like this in our company, but our culture would not support it. And I always mm. say, when I look at you, I am looking at your culture. Every time you walk through the door, pick up the phone, send a text, an email, you are reinforcing something that is either healthy or not healthy uh, you know, it, within your culture. You are it. And so when we think about relationships, when somebody says, well, you don't know my partner. I mean, this person is impossible to talk to or whatever. Um, and I, you know, I just can never find exactly the right time. It's as if we're waiting for the sun, moon, and stars to be in perfect alignment, the right music in the background, you know, everybody's in the right mood. And when we do that, we're not likely to have the conversation. So we have to understand, look, this is up to me. This is, you know, this is, I need to go first. I need to have it. And it's not so much that I think my partner is impossible to talk to when I'm really truthful with myself is that I'm scared. <laughs> I'm the one yes. who's, who's worried. I mean, whether you, whatever you might feel about Woody Allen, he did say some funny things. And one of the things he said one time is, I'm not afraid of death. I just don't want to be in the room when it happens. <laughs> I'm not afraid of this conversation. I just don't want to be in the room when it happens. Exactly. And I don't want to be a part of it. Exactly. I really like the relationship. Just stop. <laughs> my part of it. I don't want to take any ownership or for that. Oh, Susan, we can talk so much more. And I'm looking forward to the next episode when we do talk some more. But I want to just have a quick wrap up about we've already just opened up the beginning of the awareness around how, first of all, we can enrich our relationships once we realize that our day-to-day -day conversations are not about the relationship. As you said, they in fact are the relationship. So what does that call us to do? Also be aware that things happen gradually and then like Tom and Louise rings into the lake, they can happen really suddenly. And what can we do to prevent that? 
get in our right frame of mind that those conversations we often have with ourselves. how can we get those conversations in the right frame of mind, in a positive frame of mind, and not be afraid of that Wizard of Oz, because it's probably just a tiny little ineffectual man after all. <laughs> yeah, we need to kick him to the curb. <laughs> He's, he is exactly. a problem child. <laughs> exactly. Get, take more control over the thoughts and, and the little man in our mind and make it a, a wonderful Emerald City that we're looking forward to going to That's and right. not, like you said afraid to go to and you know gina I, I there's one other thought that i think might be good to to leave everybody with yes uh, so when i talk about we are all navigating our lives and certainly our relationships one conversation at a time and if we don't stay current with one another then we can drift it's like if you think about mariners at sea um you know, if their course is off by a tiny amount at the beginning, by the end, they're completely lost. So we, we really need to understand that we're steering it. And, and sometimes people are so passive and I wanna to say to them, look, get out of the passenger seat, take the wheel, drive, you know, you're driving and you can do this. And there's so much at stake for you to gain if you have these conversations or to lose if you avoid them. Absolutely. And on that note, pick your metaphor. You can get in the car and drive. You can get in the boat and craft your <laughs> sail and get your oars. But do understand that now with Susan Scott by your side, the Fierce Love Podcast at your ears, you are going to be getting more and more tools to help set that course in the direction that's going to be beneficial for you and for your romantic partner. And that's a bonus if ever, if, if ever there was one. Easy for me to say. I'm so delighted to spend this inaugural podcast launch with you. And I want to say once again to everyone listening, find and look for the Fierce Love Podcast in all the wonderful places that you receive your podcast. And also, before we go, as you're listening, if you have a conversation that you are having or afraid to have or that you've had that didn't go well or one that did go well, please share that on Susan Scott Fierce Facebook page. And we'll look forward to possibly spotlighting it and talking about it on an upcoming podcast. So from Gina London, and, and Scott, <laughs> thank you for listening to the Fierce Love Podcast. <laughs>